Rod, thank you for your kind words. There's always been a, well, since at least the 1860s, there's always been an anti-Lincoln strain in American culture. Uh, a, Lincoln is probably the most widely admired president, uh, many surveys show, but there are also, have always been people who really just hated the man. I, uh, in the past few years, discovered the newest theme in this anti-Lincoln narrative. Back in 2003, you may recall, a statue of Lincoln and his son Todd was to be unveiled at National Park headquarters in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, you may remember that Lincoln, with his son uh, Tad, uh, visited Richmond shortly after it fell to the Union Army in 1865. And this statue was to commemorate that event. This caused a firestorm of opposition among particularly the uh, Sons of Confederate Veterans chapter in Richmond. And when my wife and I arrived to see the unveiling, there couldn't be any demonstrations on National Park Service property, but uh, outside the uh, entrance to the headquarters, about uh, at least 50 demonstrators, many of them in period costume, demonstrating a no, you know, Lincoln was our enemy, was holding signs. One of the common signs was, no statue of a war criminal. Abraham Lincoln, war criminal. I said, hmm, war criminal. Well, I know something about that. Uh, maybe I'll look, take a look at it. As I say, the, uh, this has become a, one of the new themes of the anti-Lincoln narrative and among people who uh, oppose Lincoln. If you Google the, the phrase, Lincoln war crime, I did this lesser day afternoon, uh, I got almost two and a half million hits. Now, of course, some of those later on deal with, you know, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and the Spanish Civil War, but uh, the ones right up front were directly responsive to this theme, that Lincoln was a cruel man who hated the Southern people. He deliberately waged war on, uh, uh, on the Southern civilian population. Uh, the term war criminal is, is a 20th century term. They didn't use it in uh, Lincoln's era. But the basic concept uh, was very, very familiar back in the Civil War, back in his era. That is that if you violate or orders others to violate the internationally accepted laws and customs of war, then uh, you can be held criminally liable. Uh, the Union practice was to use the military commissions for this purpose. Well, I decided to take a look. As I said, I, I know something about this. Uh, the serious historians, of course, just brush this charge aside. Uh, but I'm not a serious historian. I'm a part-time law professor. And uh, so I decided, well, I'll take a look at this. Is there any truth at all in this narrative? Uh, Civil War was immensely destructive to civilian property, as we all know. To what extent was the president actually responsible for some of these things? So I looked for, for three things. One, first of all, what were the standards of Lincoln's time? What were the internationally recognized laws and customs of war? Because in the American Civil War, by the end of 1861, in effect, we're applying international law to a civil war. The South had gotten that much concession out of the North that the international laws of war would apply to the conflict from that point on. So what were the standards of his time? Secondly, how did the president, how did Lincoln become involved in setting policy on the enforcement of the laws of war, and particularly in relation to civilians? And thirdly, did Lincoln try to rise above the standards of his time? And were there any problems in his uh, approach to the treatment of Southern civilians? Excuse me. On the first issue, what were the standards of his time? We think of the Civil War still as uh, probably influenced a bit by uh, Gone with the Wind. But we still tend to think of the Civil War as still a chivalrous conflict. Well, the standard, the generally accepted standards of civilized warfare in the mid-1800s were very, very different from the 1949 Geneva Conventions. The, uh, many of the rules accepted at that time were not particularly chivalrous. One prime example, bombardment of besieged cities and towns. If a city or town was defended, had walls, had fortifications around it, was defended by an armed force, and uh, this town was 
being attacked by the enemy, it was considered perfectly acceptable, maybe not polite, but perfectly acceptable to bombard the entire town, including the civilian areas. And the, uh, the theory was here that the civilian population, particularly the richer merchants, would put pressure on the enemy commander to either withdraw from the town or to surrender it uh, to the besieging force. The biggest difference between modern standards and the standards of the mid-1800s, however, related to anti-guerrilla measures. These were measures that an occupying army could take in order to stamp out unlawful belligerents or more recently they called unlawful combatants, people who are either civilians, uh, not, in, not in uniform, hold themselves out as peaceful civilians, but then necessarily, unnecessarily take up arms to fight the invader, or uh, even regular soldiers who don civilian clothes to uh, hide their presence among the civilian population and then later use that duplicity to attack uh, the occupying force. It was widely accepted in American and in European wars that the occupying army could impose the, or apply the concept of collective responsibility. Now, what this means is that necessarily guerrillas, unlawful belligerents, have to, have to operate in a friendly civilian environment to keep hidden. So you could hold the entire civilian population around an area where a guerrilla attack had, had occurred responsible for that attack and punish the whole, the whole area, all the people in an area. The, uh, probably the lowest level of collective responsibility would be to, to level a collective fine on an area. Uh, if, a, uh, uh, if the uh, railroad station or if supplies were burned at a particular railroad station by guerrillas, everyone within a five-mile radius of the area might be assessed a certain amount of money to help reimburse the government. If Union soldiers were killed by an ambush by guerrillas, everybody in a one-mile area or whatever might be assessed a certain amount, and that amount would be given to the widow and children of the killed soldiers. Fines and assessment. Going up one level, it was very widely accepted that if enemy fire came from a civilian house, Without warning, uh, the house would be burned. And the same thing could apply also as a retaliatory measure, again, as a result of guerrilla attacks. If the fines don't work, you, can, you burn the houses of everybody within a certain radius of the incident. I say it's widely, everybody, does, everybody does, did this in the uh, mid-1800s. And finally, at the highest level, you have the practice uh, even at the time, recognized as extreme, but accepted, of taking what are called reprisal prisoners. Taking prisoners, and even though they were not involved in the guerrilla acts that uh, you're, you're trying to stop, killing them, executing them in retaliation for killings performed by guerrillas. So things could be pretty brutal, pretty uncivilized in the Civil War. This whole concept of collective responsibility of the civilian population for uh, in an occupied area was not finally outlawed until after World War II in the 1949 Geneva Convention on Civilians. So those standards were a little different than what we think they might have been. How did Lincoln become involved in civilian policy I issues for his army? Well, we're used to presidents who are proactive, who issue hundreds, thousands of executive orders during their term of office. Tell, like, giving general guidance to the executive branch how to carry out their duties. Lincoln's era was a little different. Lincoln did not do that. He did not issue, did not tend to issue general guidance to his commanders in the field, or in some cases even to his cabinet, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, on how he wanted the war carried out, how he wanted Southern civilians to be treated. There are a few exceptions to this, but generally he acted on an ad hoc basis. He waited until a complaint came to him through whatever channels that an abuse was occurring in Tennessee, Maryland, uh, Shenandoah Valley, wherever. And he would act on those complaints. 
An example of this uh, in the area of collective fines. In September of 1863, a lighthouse on the eastern shore of Virginia was burned down deliberately. It was deliberately destroyed. The eastern shore of Virginia, as you may know, was part of the, uh, was occupied by Union forces. It was in Union hands throughout the war. The local commander there thought that the civilian population sabotaged the lighthouse, and so he assessed a collective fine of $20,000 against 221 citizens of Northampton County. These are the people he identified uh, as probably being the disloyal or pro-Confederate part of the population. Appeal went to Lincoln. Lincoln suspended the fine. Uh, Lincoln, recognized, Lincoln regarded these collective fines as, as an effective counter guerrilla tool. He said this in a couple of his letters. But he was very, very concerned that they not be abused and uh, that they not be used for corrupt purposes. So in this particular case, he did suspend the fine. And in this case, his instincts were in fact correct because the lighthouse in fact had not been destroyed by guerrilla activity by the civilian population. That lighthouse was later learned was destroyed by a regular Confederate Navy raiding party uh, from the Virginia mainland led, led by a Confederate naval officer named John Yates Beale. Now, as I said, he did not issue general executive orders on uh, how the Army should behave. Now, some of you are probably scratching your heads, well, what about General Order Number 100, the so-called Lieber Code? It's true, the President did sign what was called General, the U.S. Army General Order Number 100, issued in April 24, 1863, and this, for the first time, tried to codify the laws and customs of war as they existed in the mid-19th century. Uh, a bit of background, of course, the beginning of the war, the U.S. Army was 16,000 men. It expands as hundreds of thousands of men, many, many officers appointed from civilian life who have no knowledge of the customs and traditions of how you treat the enemy, how you treat the civilian population. And in order to provide some guidance to these uh, amateur officers, uh, General Halleck, the commanding general of the Army, asked Professor Francis Lieber of Columbia College, today Columbia University, to uh, draw up a, a summary of what the existing laws and customs of war were. And this was the first codification in writing of the laws and customs of war, and it greatly influenced later treaty negotiations. Uh, and it's the direct ancestor of the 1949 Geneva Conventions we have today. Well, Lincoln signed this, but he, it's very clear from the story of record he had absolutely no role in writing it. I think he read it. I think he was very interested in it because some of the positions he took later. But he had absolutely no role in writing it. It was basically done by uh, Professor Lieber and a couple of generals then made, I think, a few minor changes to it. Now, he did formulate general policies on how civilians were to be treated and civilian property. But very often, he did not bother to communicate these to his commanders in the field, or as I say, sometimes even to his, his own cabinet officers. Well-known example, peril of being left-handed, I keep knocking my thing. Uh, Well-known example, General Grant's infamous order to exclude Jews as a class from his military department in the Midwest. Lincoln revoked this, or made sure that Stanton had it revoked. But thereafter, no general order issued, you know, do not discriminate on the, uh, the basis of religion in ordering the exile of people. Uh, no general order issued, just a one-time precedent. Uh, maybe even better example also relates to religious uh, property, particularly the property of churches in occupied territory or in uh, uh, churches particularly involved in what would be thought by the Union Army to be disloyal activity. This issue first rose in late 1862 in the case of Dr. Samuel McFeeters, who was minister at the Vine Street Presbyterian Church in St. Louis, Missouri. Reverend McFeeters was a uh, staunch pro-Confederate. He prayed for Jefferson Davis, uh, gave sermons uh, uh, supporting the secessionist cause. The local military authorities ordered him exiled from the state of Missouri, and they then removed the disloyal elders that ran the church and installed a group of 
loyal unionist elders to run the church in their place. Complaint was made, eventually arrived on the desk of the president. And he revoked this. And he established a general policy that, quote, that the U.S. government must not undertake to run churches. General policy. He applies it several times in the coming year. Well, then, in November of 1863, but, but he apparently doesn't even tell his cabinet, even his Secretary of War about it. Uh, in November of 1863, St uh, Secretary of War Stanton issues a general order giving a Methodist bishop, Ames, Mr. Ames, Dr. Ames, authority over all disloyal Methodist churches uh, in, as, in the area the Union Army occupies. And uh, Bishop Ames is to go down and make sure that these disloyal uh, ministers and uh, board members in the Methodist churches in the South are replaced with good, loyal Unionist Methodists. Of course, complaints come. They come from Kentucky. They come again from Missouri. And uh, Lincoln then, in fe on February 11, 1864, writes a little note to Secretary Stanton. If you read between the lines, it's not too hard to tell uh, that the president is more than a little irked with his Secretary of War. He explained his policy. Government is not to run churches. Hands off the churches. You know, if the ministers are pe preaching treason, arrest them as you would preach it, uh, you know, uh, anyone else who tried to encourage treason, but don't run the churches. After explaining this, he goes on, quote, after having made these declarations in good faith and in writing, you can conceive of my embarrassment at now having brought to me what purports to be a formal order of the War Department, bearing the date November 30th, 1863, giving Bishop Ames control and possession of all the Methodist churches in certain southern military departments, whose pastors have not been appointed by a loyal bishop or bishops, and ordering the military to aid him in any, against any resistance which may be made to his taking such position and control. What is to be done about it? I like say you can pretty. It's one of the few times I think when Lincoln's writing to Stanton that you can tell he is not happy with what Stanton has done. Uh, Lincoln was a good politician. He talked to Stanton. They they came up with a compromise. Uh, it was word was sent out. Okay, for one thing, you got to remember that the the Methodist Church in the North was one of the uh, most staunch supporters of the Union war effort. Stanton probably just viewed this as normal political patronage. You know, the Methodists are behind us. We're going to help out Bishop Ames, give him, some, give him uh, authority. And uh, they didn't want to um, uh, embarrass Bishop Ames, who was a strong supporter. But word went out, well, this doesn't apply to loyal states like Kentucky and Missouri, who technically had never seceded. And, uh, and so they, they come up with a compromise. Uh, but it's very clear, no other no other church official in any other denomination is ever given this kind of authority again. Uh, Stanton gets the message. So, this is how Lincoln got involved. He waited until, even when he had general policies, he didn't often communicate them. Well, did he try to raise, rise above the standards of his time? Well, yes and no. In some areas, pretty clearly no particularly in the area of bombardment of cities under siege. He wrote some things that were, uh, in retrospect, uh, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty brutal. During the Peninsular Campaign, General McClellan's effort to capture Richmond in 1862, May 26, 1862, uh, he telegraphs McClellan as he's advancing up the Virginia Peninsula toward Richmond. Quote, can you get near enough to throw shells into the city? Close quote. McClellan came back the same day. Hope very soon to be able to, to be within shelling distance, unquote. It's kind of interesting. You think of McClellan as a, a soft war general. And later, remember, he gave that infamous uh, essay to Lincoln about how the war should be conducted on the highest Christian principles. For McClellan, the highest Christian principles prohibited freeing slaves, 
But he had no problem at all with uh, throwing shells into a, uh, a populated city and in, into the uh, civilian areas. And I say this was he, he, uh, this wasn't something he thought of. He was uh, on the staff, as was Robert E. Lee, and, uh, during the, the siege of Veracruz during the Mexican War under the command of General Scott. And Scott did the same thing. He uh, shelled the entire city to get it to surrender. He even refused to allow uh, foreign civilians to leave the city. The local consuls came out to him and said, can we, allow, can we have a ceasefire so our nationals can get out? British and French consuls, nope. Back in the city, you, you're part of the civilian population. You stay there. If you don't like this, you talk to the Mexican commandant about surrender. So he had learned his lesson. McClellan had learned his lesson from a, a good teacher, Winfield Scott. Uh, even later, October 25th, 1863, this is during the long, prolonged siege of Charleston. A uh, delegation of army officers on leave came up to visit the president from the siege. And apparently he asked them, well, uh, are you shelling the city? Are you throwing uh, sh shells into the city? And if not, why not? And in fact, the army officers reportedly said, well, we prefer to, uh, we, you know, we've tried that. It hasn't worked very well. We prefer to hold our ammunition to actually uh, knock down the fortifications if it ever comes to time for an assault. So in the area of besieged cities, Lincoln did not rise above the standards of his time. In other cases, some of these individual cases that came up to him, he, gener he did try to rise above the standards of his time, many, many cases. Example being the case of the uh, uh, assessment on the eastern shore of Virginia for destruction of the White House. But, again, he often accepted pushback from his officers if, uh, if they had a good military reason for what they were planning to do. I mentioned already that lifted, uh, in retaliation uh, cases, he lifted the fine on Northampton County, Virginia. House burning, an occasional case where a house was, bought, was going to be burned was, uh, uh, came to his attention and he ordered a stop to it. This was, however, as had a standard practice uh, in European and Western Hemisphere armies in response to guerrilla activities. But then in the summer of 1864, uh, things began to get, uh, excuse the expression, a little hot. Uh, as you may know, General Hunter uh, was proceeding up the uh, Shenandoah Valley and uh, issued a proclamation that anyone who aided guerrillas, uh, he was his supply line to, the, to uh, uh, the Potomac River, was very tenuous, very vulnerable to guerrilla attacks. Anyone who aided guerrillas would have their house burned. He first carried this out in Lexington, Virginia, as you may know, where uh, he had found a printed poster uh, in a print shop that former governor, Virginia governor uh, uh, Lecter had proclaimed, had, it was going to issue a proclamation calling on all the Valley residents to rise and fight the invader any way they could. Hunter viewed this as an incitement of civilians to attack his troops illegally, and he burned Lecter's house in, uh, in Lexington. Well, July 11th and 12th, we are in the middle of Jubal Early's advance on Washington, and Postmaster Montgomery, Montgomery Blair's mansion, Falkland, up in Silver Spring, was burned to the ground. Not too clear whether it was deliberately burned by Early's troops or not. General Early later said, well, I didn't authorize it, but if I'd known about it, I sure would have authorized it. <laughs> uh, in in retaliation, because of, uh, I thought Hunter went outside of line, burning too many houses. And Hunter was a little bit over-enthusiastic about burning houses. He took this, uh, uh, this practice and made it more general than it probably should have been. Then, of course, most famously, a couple weeks after the uh, burning of Montgomery Blair's mansion, one of Early's subordinates, General McCausland, raids Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, demands a certain amount of money, or the town would be burned. By the way, th this was, by the way, was, was perfectly acceptable, too. It was perfectly acceptable to, for an invading army to go to a, uh, a region or a town and ask for a contribution, close quote, co a certain amount of money. Raise this amount of money in the next 24 hours or so, or your town will be burned. This goes back to the 1600s. Uh, and, uh, but was maintained throughout the 17 and early 1800s as a standard practice uh, to demand contributions to help support an invading army. 
Chambersburg, as you well know, was not able to come up with the money. The town was set on fire. About a half of it was burned. That's July 30th. Stanton and Lincoln things, think things have gotten a little out of hand. At this point, on August 14, 1864, Lincoln sends a telegram to General Grant. You may remember Grant is down at uh, City Point at this point, besieging C uh, 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 Petersburg and Richmond. So Grant is in the field with the Army of the Potomac. Telegram from the President, quote, the Secretary of War and I concur that you had better confer with General Lee and stipulate for a mutual discontinuance of house burning and other destruction of private property. The time and manner of conference, particulars of stipulation, we leave on our part to your convenience and judgment." End quote. And we got, this brings up another minor point that uh, military to military communications on purely military matters uh, are to this day regarded as not having any political significance. Main example being a, a local ceasefire, maybe to gather up the sick and wound, the wounded on the, on the battlefield or something like that. So what Lincoln is proposing is that Grant and Lee, as the opposing commanders, come up with a, uh, a purely military to military agreement, no more house burning in retaliation for things. Grant pushes back. Uh, Grant, as you may recall, after Vicksburg, he paroled, uh, I think about 20,000 Confederate prisoners. He didn't have room for the prisoners of war that time, so he paroled them. He gave, had them sign a promise they would not go back into active military service until they had been exchanged, until an equal number of Union prisoners uh, uh, had, been, had been released or had, their paroles had been lifted. Uh, Jefferson Davis said, okay, I'll disregard those paroles. We can just regard all those 20,000 guys as having, had, having been exchanged. And well, for the Yankees pick out which ones they, which paroled people in, the, in their hands they want to regard as having the parole, got a parole lifted. Well, that was not the way things were supposed to be done. Uh, Davis was acting a, a more than a little uh, high-handedly in doing this. So Grant shoots back as a result of his experience. He says, the Confederate, it's no use entering into agreements with the Confederates. They can't be trusted. The rebels, after all. As an alternative, he proposes that either he, General Grant, or the president issue an order against burning houses in retaliation, and then see if the rebels will reciprocate, will uh, issue a similar order to, to their troops. Sound like a good plan? But nothing was ever done. Grant never issued the order. Lincoln never issued the order. Not clear why. Uh, what does seem to have happened is, at least in the Eastern Theater, this practice of house burning seems to have kind of dropped off naturally. I think both sides realized they'd carried things a little bit too far. So the, the, but the order was never issued. Again, definite policy adopted. No follow through to issue a general, uh, a general uh, uh, order. Another case of retaliation where the local commander pushes back. This is the case of a major wolf, a gorilla held in Missouri. In November of 1864, the, uh, well, a, a Union major had been captured by guerrillas in Missouri. As you may know, Missouri had a horrible guerrilla problem, uh, both Union and Confederate irregular uh, forces fighting, uh, committing atrocities and whatnot. A uh, Major Wilson, James Wilson, a uh, Union major, was killed after being captured well, a prisoner of war by the uh, Confederate guerrillas. General Rosecrans, the Missouri commander at that time, had a major in the guerrilla forces in his custody, and he decreed that Enoch O. Wolf would be executed in retaliation. Even though he had nothing to do with the killing of Wilson, he'd be executed in retaliation. Several uh, prominent Missourians rise to Wolf's defense. It comes to the president's attention, and he sends a telegram to Rosecrans, hold off, no execution of Major Wolf. Rosecrans pushes back, he pushes back hard. He says that, uh, look, this is necessary for the security of my men. Uh, gives a long telegram explaining, we, we have a horrible problem here with the guerrillas killing our prisoners. We've got to do, respond in kind if they're going to make them stop. So the president 
sends back this message, November 19, 1864. A major wolf, as it seems, was under sentence in your department to be executed in retaliation for the murder of a Major Wilson. And I, without any particular knowledge of the facts, was induced by appeals for mercy to order the suspension of his execution until further order. Understanding that you so desire, this letter places the case again within your control, with the remark only that I wish you to do nothing merely for revenge, but that what you may do shall be solely done with reference to the security of the future. Well, apparently, Rosecrans did rethink things. Major Wolf was not executed. He was later exchanged as a prisoner of war. Uh, but this, this reflects a, a clear pattern in Lincoln's thinking in these individual cases. He asked, was, was there really a military necessity for this, or is this just an act of revenge and cruelty? He's strongly against uh, acts of revenge, but if the local commander can come up with a valid military reason, he may well back him. It's the old uh, reason versus emotion tension. Lincoln, remember, is, even as early as 1838, is trying to say we've got to keep emotion out of our pol politics and political decisions. Uh, famously in his uh, perpetuation of our political institutions speech in 1838, he called for reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason should furnish the materials for our future support and defense. And as I say, this was consistent with the spirit of, of the Lieber Code because in six different articles, Lieber makes it clear, don't do any act out of revenge it's to, or cruelty. It's to be done solely for good military uh, military reasons. Should he have issued more general directives to restrain his armies? Um, I think quite possibly he should. Right after my, after my manuscript was submitted, Kenneth No, a uh, professor of Auburn University, published a study called Reluctant Rebels. He looked at, at uh, men in the South who joined the Confederate Army after 1861 who weren't really enthusiastic about the cause to begin with, but joined later, he found that one of the primary motivations for the, uh, these later rebels joining the army was behavior of Union armies in the field. Uh, a quote here from his article in Civil War Times. Later enlisted Confederates believed by 1862 that Union soldiers were merciless hirelings and bloodthirsty barbarians who would make war on women and children wreak havoc on their property and southern landscape. And uh, so maybe it would, would have been worth Lincoln's time to issue more general de uh, declarations, more, uh, trying to restrain his armies in the field. Even just because something's legal doesn't mean it's a good idea. And uh, final settlement of the Civil War required that the Southern population accept that they had lost the war, that they not continue with guerrilla activities after the war. And uh, restraining the army may have been uh, a little more may have been uh, in his interest. As I say, this is after my book was published. One of those things that would go at a nice other, another chapter if I'd known about it beforehand. Uh, and Lincoln knew that the volunteer armies of the Civil War were very, very destructive of civilian property. He knew this not just because of his visits to the Army of the Potomac in the field. Uh, Civil War armies sucked up wood. Anything made of wood would be destroyed, whether it was a chicken coop a, a rail fence or a house. It would be used for cooking. It would be used to build uh, uh, huts for, for winter quarters called shebangs. But the army just took all, everything that was wood within a 10-mile radius usually. But this didn't matter what side you were on. Both armies, armies of both sides did this. It didn't matter the loyalty of the civilians or not. Lincoln also knew this because of his own experiences in the Black Hawk War. Brief experience. If there was any uh, organized military group that was less disciplined than the armies of the Civil War, it was undoubtedly the Illinois militia in 1832 during the Black Hawk War. One Illinois farmer wrote to the U.S. Army authorities that, uh, quote, the militia had caused him 10 times as much damage as the Indians had ever done. <laughs> According to one of Herndon's informants, Captain Lincoln, when he was captain of his company, came on the, his came across his men as they were looting an abandoned farmhouse and farm. And I'm quoting from the informant. There were plenty of chickens about said cabin, and the boys heard a voice saying, slay and eat. So they went to shooting, clubbing, and running them as long as they could, any could be found. Lincoln came across the group when they were finishing their repast and remarked, eating chicken, boys? Not much, sir, was the reply. <laughs> 
Lincoln was then offered what remained of a smoked pork jowl discovered in the smokehouse, uh, which he accepted. So Lincoln knew that these armies could cause a lot of damage. Uh, I speculate on various psychological reasons why he may, and philosophical reasons why he may not have thought it would have been worthwhile for him to exercise more control. But uh, perhaps he really should have. Okay, going back to our three conclusions. Lincoln did not violate the standards of his time. He's not a war criminal in either 19th and uh, 20th century senses. He acted largely on individual cases and not issuing general proclamations. And he did try to rise above the standards of his time in many of these individual cases. He did often defer to military judgment, however, if there was a valid military re reason. Uh, main consideration was this particular strong measure, term he used, based on valid military judgment or revenge. And again, I think uh, we might at the end also ask, but was this approach wise in the end? Because he did need to have the southern civilian population accept defeat in the war and uh, he might have, might have been more wise for Lincoln to spend more time on trying to regulate his armies in the field. And with that, I'll end, and I guess we open up for questions, do we, at this point? Any questions? Comments? Uh, Mr. Carnahan, I enjoyed your, uh, your entire lecture here today. Um, I was curious, though, you know, I read about uh, in, in the book, I'm just reading as you were mm -hmm. speaking, actually, and uh, there are a number of times when the generals like John Pope mm -hmm. would issue orders and seemingly get, try to get approval from the president, mm -hmm. but on the same day, they were issuing the order, you know, they're asking the yeah. president for approval, but they're also just issuing the order on that very same day. Assume, so it kind of assumes that these generals are just thinking they're going to get approval one way or another, <laughs> that the president is leaving it to their discretion for the most part. But can you think of uh, other examples where he just put his foot down and said, no, we can't do that? Uh, the question was, uh, these generals were, did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. good. In the case of John Polk, you're perfectly correct. Polk had been, had been acting as an informal military advisor for several weeks before this. I think, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Polk had been uh, acting as an uh, informal military advisor for, for Lincoln for several weeks before this. Uh, I think Lincoln knew what, uh, that Pope was, uh, what Pope had planned. Every order Pope gave, by the way, was perfectly within the laws of customs of war at the time. The war just hadn't been waged that way up to that point. Uh, so, yeah, I think that they, uh, Lincoln knew what was coming. And uh, other cases, of course, a case where he put his foot down, again, these are, tend to be individual cases that come up. A primary example would be Grant, uh, Grant's order about the Jews. And, uh, but uh, I'm not aware of any case, again, where he actually issued a general directive to his, his armies to hold off on a certain, such as, except for this one abortive attempt to get a ban on house burning that uh, when Grant didn't follow through, he uh, uh, just left it. Uh, Sherman, by the way, if you look at Sherman's, uh, Sh Sherman left a written record that is perfectly immaculate. You read his field orders, you know, foraging is to be done and you know, certain parties always under control of an officer, you're not to enter private homes, blah, blah, blah. Problem was, Sherman made it very clear from the beginning of his, of his leaving of Atlanta toward the sea, he was not going to make any effort to enforce those orders. So again, Sherman's a bit, a bit wily. He's not even letting Grant know what he's doing. Uh, he, the paper record, he looks great, uh, but he lets it be known in his army. Go to it, boys. And they did. Thank so you very much. Your question? Yes, thank, thank you very you. much. Sorry. I, I enjoyed your talk. I have a question about a general order that Lincoln did mm -hmm. give for a major problem that was never solved, and that was the murder and execution of black prisoners of war yeah. and their officers. He issues an order, making it clear in the order that for the equal numbers that are taken back, does not enforce it, never solves the problem, right. and many people feel a betrayal of the African-American soldiers. Right. I was wondering if you can comment on that. Yeah. Um, Frederick Douglass, writing after the war, uh, he had, well, Frederick Douglass is one of those who urged Lincoln. Uh, what, what had happened was that when the United States started to raise African-American troops, and as I say, there was a process customary at the time of exchanging prisoners of war during the war. 
the U.S. Commissioner for Exchange would offer a list of uh, soldiers captured from the U.S. colored troops, and the Confederate would simply look at it and turn to him and say, we have no such prisoners. It would just be like disappear, you know, like being disappeared. No one knew what happened to them. They couldn't prove they were killed. There were rumors. It was very difficult to tell what, what actually was happening. Finally, Lincoln did suspend exchanges on the, on the basis of this, and this was a retaliatory action, suspending the exchange system, uh, because he, and, very, and very politically unpopular. So in that sense, he did take retaliatory action. Uh, it was very politically unpopular because, naturally, the Union prisoners of war, being held in pleasant circumstances like in Andersonville, uh, their, their uh, uh, brothers, cousins, sons and whatnot are voters and are writing to their congressmen, get my husband, brother, slash out of that place. Get him back. Start exchanges again. You know, don't, uh, wor you don't worry about black people. Get our white people back. And so it was politically un unpopular, and he did take that as a retaliatory action. And eventually, in early 1865, the South did concede and start exchanging black prisoners of war, too. As about the uh, retaliatory order to actually execute uh, uh, Confederate soldiers, uh, Frederick Douglass wrote an essay in the 1880s uh, when he said, well, really, this, he just couldn't stomach that, that he, uh, he had understood that and that Douglass accepted it, that, it was, that Lincoln had told him, I, it, I just can't kill men deliberately for something that they didn't do. So he just couldn't, that was Douglass's take in talking with Lincoln, that Lincoln just couldn't stomach actually carrying it out. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Dr. Carnahan. Uh, thank you for most interesting uh, and factual presentation. It, it, I'm a generalist and not a specialist, uh, but it is just amazing what uh, some of the facts of uh, retaliatory and the burning that uh, were enforced to a greater or lesser degree and uh, how this was done on the day-to-day -day thing. Two questions uh, just real uh, quickly on the decree or the order to the Methodist to Bishop Ames, yes. how uh, many of the of his uh, flock, his preachers, uh, were prosecuted for treason? And number two, on the retaliatory, did, was there enough mercy uh, by the Union, we'll say, or both sides when they wanted to burn a town or more than just a house to at least uh, clear out uh, the people from there? Or what was it really done uh, in the middle of the night or whenever and uh, people perished from that? Uh, and the, to address the, uh, uh, the first part of your question, I'm sorry, was yes. what about? Bishop Ames Bishop and how Ames. much I'm sorry, I really don't know. I. He was not given authority to actually prosecute anybody, just remove him from the church. Yes, yeah. It'd be up to the local Union occupying commander whether he thought the guy deserved to be thrown in jail or brought before a military commission. And I, frankly, I, I don't know how many of the preachers were actually brought before a commission. I think very few. Probably wouldn't be too popular. Uh, as to the uh, burning of houses, the practice was to, bring, to get the people out. Uh, and again, if, if you have higher level Officers involved in this generally they tended to give people more time, you know, give several hours to get their stuff out. But again, this was you know dealing with cruelty and revenge here too, hatred of the rebels. Uh, officers sometimes just said, "Get out now! You've got 15 minutes. Now you know. Right. Now you've got 14 minutes. You know, get to get your stuff out." And uh, it varied a great deal. Uh, but generally, yes, they, they they did not deliberately burn houses with people in them. Uh, some guerrillas, I think, did that on both sides of Missouri, but uh, uh, the regular armies did not. Yes, thank you. One of the darkest blots on Lincoln's record, uh, uh, in the eyes of many people, is General Orders Number 11, and uh, which was a kind of ethnic cleansing of four counties in western Missouri. And to what extent was Lincoln Im implicated in that decision, and how justified was that decision? That's interesting. Uh, the background here is that. Uh, Oh, what's the town in Kansas was burned? Lawrence. Yeah, Lawrence, Kansas had been burned by Quantrell's people and, uh, in 1864. Uh, the, Kansas, the Kansas Union soldiers just hated Missourians. This goes back to the bloody Kansas era. And the commander of the U.S. forces in northwestern Missouri after the burning of Lawrence is concerned that the Kansans are going to come in and uh, 
enact retaliatory measures, so he decides to get ahead of them. He has the four counties around Kansas City completely depopulated. People move out, completely depopulated. And uh, this is in general, or famous general order number 11. The order is executed by Kansas troops who are in many cases not too gentle in how they make sure these orders are carried out. This doesn't come to Lincoln's attention until later. And uh, some have said, well, he approved this. He approved this. Well, let's look at the circumstances. This order was brought to his attention by a party of Missouri politicians visiting him to argue that the local general was being too soft on the local Confederates. And uh, not, not, not that the, he was not objecting to this. Uh, by the time Lincoln learned about it, it had already been carried out. The people were moved. The damage was done. So what he, uh, what he did, he wrote a letter back, and I'm trying to remember the name of the, uh, of the general that he wrote to me. He wrote a letter back to him. He said, you know, you've carried out these measures. I, guess I approve this measure. I approve this measure. As to the general order number 11, he says, I will not interfere at this time with general order number 11. And then he goes on. You know, but make sure it's, uh, it's still timely. Now, if you're, a, if you're familiar with bureaucracy and you get from your supervisor or from your secretary a note saying, well, we approve this, 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 and this, we're not going to interfere with what you're doing on this at this time, subordinates pick up the message pretty quickly. I better change that before he changes his mind. And in fact, the uh, order was revoked later, I think by Halleck's order, and uh, uh, Halleck was general of all the armies. But, uh, yeah, in a sense, he approved it, but the damage already be done. He was sending a between-the-lines notice to local commander, reverse this as soon as you can. So I think it's wrong to say that he actually approved it. Oh, by the way, there, there still is, to this day, uh, very little limitation on the powers of military commanders to move people out of a, an area that particularly where they think they're going to be military operations. That's one area that hasn't gotten much uh, limitation by international treaty at all. Any other questions? Of course, I, could I just follow sure. up? Uh, yeah. To what extent was it justified, the depopulation of those four counties? Uh, well, <laughs> sir, good question. Uh, because in one sense, uh, what the general was trying to do, he was trying to remove pop people who may be unions who would be subject to retaliation by the, uh, by the Kansans. Uh, and it certainly did cut down on girl activity for a time, but of course all these abandoned farms and houses would be looted by Kansas troops and guerrillas would start to uh, get it into them. Uh, as I say, it was reversed pretty quickly, within a couple of months, so I can't think it was that terribly necessary. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Second. Uh, could I have your attention for a second? If you're interested in, more interested in what happened to Major Wolf, uh, the whole incident is covered in some detail in the catalog to the uh, Dis Discovering the Civil War exhibit that's on sale out, uh, out here on pages 92 to 94 uh, as a complete record of what happened to Major Wolf and what the background was if you're interested in that incident.